good evening everyone so today we are going to uh, discuss another very interesting topic gi neuroendocrine tumors it's always considered as one of the very difficult tumors to deal with and today we are having dr manish singhal with us dr manish singhal is a senior consultant medical oncologist at indraprastha apollo hospitals new delhi he is an alumnus of prestigious all india institute of medical sciences new delhi from where he has done his dm in medical oncology and uh, he is also a european certified medical oncologist and he was awarded for scoring highest marks in global examination for or uh, known as esmo he is uh, academically one of the most enriched medical oncologists working uh, with us we are pleased and we are uh, glad to have sir with us for sharing his experience about managing neuroendocrine tumors welcome sir to this evening session on oncology classroom forum thank you so much and may i now request you to take over the session and start your presentation Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Doctor, and I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Can you just call me after some time? I'm in a meeting. so i hope my screen is visible to everybody yes sir yeah and it's moving as well yes it's moving so uh, uh thanks to dr dodel and uh, i think the oncology classrooms is going on very well and in next half an hour or so uh, i'll try to discuss uh, on uh, uh, gi uh, neuroendocrine tumors and uh, and i think uh, what is known to everybody is that it is an amalgamation of different grades of disease and different sides of disease and which is formally divided into foregut midgut and hindgut but i think this is mostly a nomenclature for to un, to better understand and dissect out this disease but more or less the concept of treatment revolves around the 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 stage of the disease and the grade of the disease so stage and grade is very very important and uh, particular syndromes are also associated with this particular Uh, neuroendocrine tumors and we need to identify those syndromes and treat them accordingly more or less the treatment is uh, same for all uh, subsets of uh, neuroendocrine tumors the principles of treatment remain the same and largely speaking the uh, the principle is if it if the disease is resectable it should be resected and if it is not resectable then perhaps you need to treat it with endocrine therapy and there are certain new agents to treat Uh, such as targeted therapies and whenever it is a high grade tumor it is chemotherapy so on that notion uh, we will start the neuroendocrine cells uh, are basically peptide forming producing cells that share neural and endocrine phenotype and they can uh, exist in different parts of the body in different forms and uh, they are uh, diffusely distributed within the skin the thyroid the lungs the thymus the genitourinary the gi and the pancreas and as you can see over here uh, one second i i'll have to knock it off and as you can see that you know different cells can give uh, there are different products of these cells such as the d cells in the gi tract uh result into somatostatin and the d cells can give rise to a uh, form of neuroendocrine tumors the ento enterochrome f in cells they, they give rise to serotonin and substance p and histamine which can give rise to uh, carcinoids so different cells and these are all uh, neuroendocrine cells or neural endocrine phenotype typic cells which can give rise to different types of hormones and products and uh, therefore they can result into different type of tumors when they become malignant so uh, depending on which cells are involved in the malignant process the different products are there and different syndromes are there associated with them and therefore uh, these are called as neuroendocrine tumors sometimes and or mostly they are you know non uh, secretory uh, cells and and are not associated with any type of syndrome 
So these cells are, and we will be discussing today about the GI tract and uh, I'll include, include the pancreas in it to discuss how do we diagnose them, how do we treat them, what are the principles of treatment and how do we approach such patients. So as said that neuroendocrine tumors uh, may have somatostatin receptors, may secrete hormones. They're slow growing tumors, usually can be treated with more than one options, but are supposedly not so common. However, the incidence seems to be rising and this is not because of increased so most experts feel that it is not because of increased modalities of treatment and increased uh, capability to diagnose neuroendocrine tumors. There is de definitely something more to it. So it is not only the increase in investigation modalities and our capability to diagnose neuroendocrine tumors. There is definitely something more to it that the incidence is rising. So histopathological assessment is not only about cell morphology and uh, a good pathologist will be able to diagnose it. With general markers that it is suspicious of neuroendocrine, but immunohistochemistry markers with uh, cytokeratin, synaptophysin, chromogranin are important, and sometimes peptide hormones such as serotonin and certain other receptors are important to diagnose it. Ki67 is a very, very important marker. Bef uh, without that, one cannot grade the tumor. So you have to have a Ki67 for tumor grading, which is a marker of proliferation. Histopathological classification, uh, the WHO 2017 classification divides it into good, bad, and ugly. So the good is KI67 of less than 2% or up to 2%, which are called as well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors uh, grade 2 are generally uh, between KI67 of 3 to 20% or they have a, uh, they have a, um, the, the multiplication or the mitosis rate of uh, two to, uh, of 3 to 20 per 10 high power field. Anything which is grade 3 is also considered well differentiated, but the KI67 of more than 20%. And neuroendocrine carcinoma is generally poorly differentiated and they have a KI67 of more than 20%, but usually it may be up uh, more than 55%. So uh, the good is the grade 1, the bad is grade 2, and uh, ugly is grade 3. And the differentiation is mainly by KI67 and uh, the mitosis rate. Sometimes uh, neuroendocrine tumors can have heterogeneity. So within, you know, as is seen in this particular uh, bar chart, a lesion 1 may have a grade 1 tumor and a lesion 10 may have a grade 3 tumor or a lesion 12 may have a grade 2 or a grade 3 uh, lesion. So this heterogeneity can develop over, over time also and uh, over as, as you keep on treating them. So it is important uh, sometimes to re-biopsy these patients whenever they are not behaving the way you expect them to behave, which means that these tumors have the capability to evolve over a period of time and become more and more heterogeneous as you keep treating them uh, and so and so forth. Uh, so uh, clinical classification is uh, generally uh, neuro pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, or gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors are there, which are further divided into foregut, midgut and hindgut. They may be functional or they may be non-functional. About 10% may have adenocarcinomas hiding in them. Uh, the types of gastric entities uh, coming to the gastric part, there are generally three types, three different subtypes of gastric neuroendocrine tumors. The most common is the type 1, which is associated with atrophic gastritis and generally have raised gastrin levels. So, and the histology is generally grade 1. The pH in this, uh, the gastric pH is alkaline and they have very low chance of metastasis. The type 2 can be associated with MEN1 and they are generally gastrinomas uh, and they generally have very high gastrin levels and very high, uh, very, very low pH or very high hyperacidity is there. They have the capability of metastasis in 10 to 30 percent and uh, the rest is type 3, which is like solitary tumors, which are grade 2, grade 3. There is no relation with gastrin levels or gastric pH. And they are non-secretory type of, uh, um, of gastric uh, entities, and they have higher chance of metastasizing. So basically, we have to differentiate between type 1 and type 2. Type 3 is separate. And uh, type 1 has trophic gastritis, and they are generally low grade, whereas gastrinomas uh, are to be treated in a separate manner and you have to consider that you have to control the acidity part by giving high dose PPIs and also resect them according to the size that we will discuss later on. Duodenal neuroendocrine tumors uh, 
are uh, generally uh, they account for one to three percent. They're mostly non-functional, but you may have duodenal gastrinomas or somatostatinomas, and 90% are located in D1, D2, and mostly they are less than two centimeters. So they can, they, you have an option of endoscopically resecting them, or uh, if they are two centimeter and, and are infiltrating into the submucosa and muscular is proper, then you have to do a full surgery. Lymph node mats are seen in about 20% patients, and hence surgery can become a very important part of the treatment. So, uh, as I said, that uh, this is generally the subdivision of uh, uh, of origin of NET, foregut, midgut, and hindgut, as you can see over here. So, history, uh, clinical examination, biochemical test, imaging, and histology are the gold standard. So, sometimes uh, clinical presentation can include carcinoid syndrome, which is flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm, and sometimes carcinoid heart disease, which generally uh, involves the right side of the heart. And uh, we have seen a, a few patients with carcinoid heart disease. And generally, uh, the carcinoid syndrome develops when there is liver metastasis. Uh, less than 5% patients uh, will have a carcinoid syndrome who do not have a liver. So as the volume of the disease increases, the chance of having a carcinoid syndrome increases. Carcinoid crisis is a severe uh, form of carcinoid syndrome with hypotension. And generally, this can develop uh, during a procedure or general anesthesia and the patient may have to be put on inotropes also. So carcinoid heart disease can involve uh, patients, uh, uh, the right heart, right side of the heart and right valves are uh, involved. And these patients will have uh, right-sided heart failures and tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary stenosis. And uh, they can uh, have very high NT4 BNP levels also. Sometimes uh, the clinical presentation does not uh, may have only dyspepsia or chronic abdominal pain, some weight loss, sometimes uh, altered bowel habits. And they are, they may be only, you know, incidentally diagnosed on surgery and endoscopy. So not necessarily that any specific symptoms may have uh, may happen. Biochemical test, promogranin A is very important and uh, it has a very good sensitivity, although the specificity is low because it can be raised in patients who are chronically on PPIs even in atrophic gastritis, renal failure, cirrhosis can have high chromogranin A levels. And uh, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas will not have a chromogranin A high levels. And sometimes rectal NETs also do not have very high levels. But chromogranin A is a useful marker and can help you guide therapy as well. Uh, more specific is 24-hour uh, uh, urinary 5-HIA levels, that is hydroxyindole acetic acid levels but mind you that certain foods such as many fruits can cause falsely positive results and they are uh, positive for uh, carcinoid uh, uh, carcinoids and gastric entities uh, sorry gastric entities will have high gastrin levels so these are specific tests as i said that those patients who have carcinoid syndrome uh, generally will have a high nt pro bnp and an echocardiography is generally required in such patients there are certain other tests which are not routinely done, which are like CTCs, and they have been uh, associated with prognostication. So some patients who have, th those who have positive CTC and have localized disease, they are likely to do poorly as compared to those, those who do not have CTCs. But these are not routinely done in, in routine care. Also, those patients who have larger decrease in the CTC upon treatment, they are associated with better responses and which we know from many other tumor types where the CTCs drop, the, the patients likely do better, but these are not routinely used. Of course, uh, generally uh, the first investigation is a conventional staging and conventional CT scan and till the time you have a diagnosis, most patients will come with a conventional CT scan or an MRI. Sometimes uh, when you have a diagnosis, you may have to do a CT enterography to find out the primary, whether the primary is lying in a small bowel or not. And uh, CT enterography can have a very good sensitivity and specificity, and it can really delineate a small uh, primary in the small intestine or a jejunum or something like that. And of course, uh, the liver metastases are easily diagnosed on a CT scan. Endoscopic ultrasound and uh, small bowel capsule endoscopy are also sometimes required to whenever there is a small lesion and the depth of invasion is to be seen an endoscopic ultrasound can really help you to see what is the size of the tumor the depth of invasion whether the patient is eligible for an endoscopic resection or not 
So all these modalities are important in diagnosing and reaching to the final diagnosis. Uh, somatostatin receptors are present on most of the neuroendocrine tumors, and this is mainly the SST2 uh, receptor, which is targeted by uh, octreotide LAR. So you can see that uh, it is present at in different strength in different uh, type of neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, so glucogonoma, insulinomas have less of SS, SST2. Uh, and hence, uh, somatostatin uh, analogs are sometimes not really used for insulinomas. Whereas for gastrinomas and carcinoid tumors, they are very well expressed. So uh, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy or octroscan is, uh, can help you reveal uh, metastatic disease in, uh, in, uh, in most patients. And generally, it is combined with a PET. However, in some patients who have grade 3 or poorly differentiated um, or, or more than KI67 or more than 20%, such patients should also undergo a FDG PET because that may pick up certain lesions which are not picked up on uh, octreo scan or a DOTA PET CT scan. So generally, uh, PET scans uh, involve DOTA, NOC, uh, Gallium 68 PET scans, and uh, they are generally combined with a CT scan. So as I said earlier, that sometimes CT is done separately and later a DOTA PET is done. But mostly nowadays, uh, they are both combined together and so that patient doesn't have to undergo two different modalities of investigation. So DOTA PET is generally done for low grade or grade one and grade two type of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Whereas grade three and FDG PET should be ordered because uh, then you are likely to miss on certain lesions as is seen in this particular uh, chart. So patient who have uh, neuroendocrine tumors, they may have de differentiated and then it is more evident on the PET CT scan. The same patient has a lesion which is FDG PET AVID and uh, one lesion which is DOTA PET AVID. So these are the uh, patients who have de-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors where, uh, where the grade can change within, uh, within the same patient. And then you have to uh, mainly treat for the high-grade tumor because the prognosis will be governed by the high-grade tumor rather than the low-grade tumor. So uh, another chart which shows that, you know, the gallium is negative, but the, uh, the FDG PET is positive. So you know that what grade of or what uh, grade of neuroendocrine tumor exists in, in that particular patient. Sometimes MRI scans are helpful in knowing whether bone metastasis has occurred and usually bone mets will occur in grade three tumors and not really grade, uh, grade one or grade two tumors. So uh, as I said, uh, this is just to show you again that uh, the, the classification is like this, the KI67 of uh, less than uh, equal to 2 is grade 1, 3 to 20 is uh, KI67 is grade 2 and more than 20 is grade 3. And mitotic count is also important for 10 high power field. So less than 2 is uh, grade 1, 2 to 20 is grade 2 and more than 20 is grade 3. This is important because grading uh, will decide the survival as you can see in these capital mere curves that grade one has the best survival followed by grade two and grade three have really poor survival. And even uh, in various studies, it has been shown that KI67 is a deciding factor. So zero to 5%, they had better survival, five to 20% had lesser survival and more than 20%. So this differentiation helps you differentiate between the various grades of uh, neuro, uh, neuroendocrine tumors which can help you uh, decide the prognosis of the patient. So uh, looking at the diagnostic algorithm, it is history, clinical examination. You need to see for any type of uh, uh, um, syndrome which exists in that patient, uh, the carcinoid syndrome or any other syndrome. Then, is, uh, then you have to do certain specific tests such as chromogranin A, which is although non-specific or 5-HIA, anti-pro BNP in patients who have carcinoid syndrome or have cardiac complaints. It's, it's good to do it at least once. And then, of course, a triple phase CT or an MRI to know uh, what is the level of uh, involvement. Generally, these two can be combined together, the 68 PET octreo scan, or uh, these can be combined to, together in a FDG PET, uh, in, in a, sorry, in a PET CT scan, which can combine the two things. Sometimes you may have to do a CT enterography or a capsule endoscopy or EUS to see uh, the, the depth of invasion in a localized disease and uh, to see what is the primary uh, by doing a CT enterography or a capsule endoscopy. Special cases, you may require an MRI of the liver or an MRI of the spine or a cardiac echocardiography. 
the biopsy will help you know what is the grade of the tumor and then that is how you will reach the treatment part so uh, this is how uh, today uh, one would diagnose neuroendocrine tumors upon suspicion or upon biopsy the patient will have uh, special uh, uh, you know uh, markers done the ka67 the histology is important ctc mi rna are experimental as of now all patient will have a chromogranin a level and uh, molecular imaging will generally allow a uh, dota pet ct scan uh, which will in incorporate a, a pet as well as a, a, a ct scan and uh, sometimes if the disease is localized you may have to do an us fnac or uf us uh, or endoscopic evaluation to see or ct enterography just to uh, see where where is the primary if the primary is not easily visible and uh, all these will help you reach the final diagnosis in a in a particular patient so treatment is uh, generally uh, medically control the patient symptoms if they have syndromes and resection so it's always to resect because resection can lead to better survival even if it is non localized in metastatic and metastatectomy can happen the answer is resection and metastatectomy if the disease is too advanced for any surgery then it is systemic therapy and improvement uh, which can improve and uh, maintain the quality of life so i'll not go into the surgery part because um, i we will dwell on the systemic therapy so the systemic therapy includes somatostatin analogs so we have got lenrotide and octreotide lenrotide is not available but octreotide lar is what we use in uh, in, uh, pa in in patients so uh, Uh, somatostatin analogs uh, are the first and the best choice because they reduce all the syndromes and uh, hypersecretion of various hormones and it can uh, reduce flushing diarrhea and bio biochemical responses can ha happen as they block these somatostatin receptors and it inhibits the secretion of the hormone by the tumor sometimes interferon alpha can be combined to control carcinoid syndrome and there are cert certain studies that over and above a lar injection uh, these can uh, interferon can help decrease flushing and uh, various other sim uh, symptoms of carcinoid syndrome pseudotide is uh, a novel multi receptor targeted somatostatin analog as i said that sst2 is what is targeted by uh, lar octreotide whereas uh, pseudotide uh, blocks not only sst2 but sst1 3 and 5 not 4 uh one two three and five and so it may have a better effect so there is uh, there there is a, a randomized control trial where uh neuroendocrine tumors with carcinoid syndrome was randomized to octreotide lar versus pseudotide however the study did not find any major difference so in the carcinoid syndrome there was no major difference between pseudotide and octreotide because in carcinoid syndrome i think sst2 which is a somatostatin receptor 2 is well represented and blocking that alone is enough and you don't really need to um, <clears throat> block other receptors by uh, giving pseudotide so there was no real uh, difference in this particular study diarrhea is one symptom which can uh, be aggravated in carcinoid syndrome so there is a drug called as uh, filotristat which has been uh, studied in the randomized controlled trial in those patients where diarrhea becomes a problem and it is not controlled so trilotristat is basically a uh, blocker of tryptophan hydroxylase which uh, basically makes uh, 5ht by 5 hydroxy tryptophan and then uh, serotonin so it blocks trypto uh, tryptophan hydroxylase and in this randomized phase 3 study where Uh, it was compared to uh, placebo so, so the lottery stat actually resulted in better control over uh, diarrhea as compared to the placebo arm uh, survival is definitely improved in case resection is possible so always resection should be done yeah, so uh, it uh, resection can lead to better survival also these patients can also have mesenteric fibrosis in midgut nets and therefore uh, one should look out for dietary modifications hydronephrosis malnutrition and small bowel bacterial overgrowth can happen so these are certain things which one has to keep in mind in case mesenteric fibrosis starts happening uh, other therapies where limited uh, metastasis is there in the liver so one can think of embolization one can also think of radiofrequency ablation and uh, last not the least 
PRT therapy is also there in uh, gastrointestinal and neuroendocrine tumors, and we'll discuss more about that. Also, the systemic therapy with mTOR inhibitors has also been studied in this particular regard, and we'll just see uh, what, what it has to offer. So as far as uh, mid-gut tumors are concerned in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we have a study called the PROMIT study where uh, placebo was compared to uh, LAR therapy, that is uh, long-acting uh, uh, long uh, uh, somatostatin receptor analog, where the median uh, time to progression was increased from six months to 14.3 months. This was a JCO publication. Also, the stable disease was increased from 37% to 66%. Another study of Landrotide called the Clarinet study was, uh, uh, was compared with placebo and the placebo arm had a median progression with survival of 18 months, which was much better than what was there in the control arm of, uh, of um, the PROMIT study, but it was a different study population, so one cannot compare a cross trial and Landrotide resulted into a betterment of um, the progression free survival. So this, uh, so both the drugs are approved, uh, both Landrutide Autogel was, uh, as also LAR30. Uh, there's another study of mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. Mind you, the other study was uh, on carcinoid syndrome. This is non-secretory uh, tumors. And uh, over here, uh, Pesiriotide LAR uh, performed better than Octotide LAR. So this is another option where the PFS was increased from 6.8 months to 11.8 months. <coughs> As I said that there is one study where octotide was combined with interferon alpha, which although did not have uh, survival benefit in mid-gut mid tumors, uh, but had a reduced risk of tumor progression, but this is not routinely used. Although uh, the NCCN guidelines does give interferon alpha as one of the treatment options to combine with octotide to get better results. But this is not what I have routinely used or I have ever used it, as a matter of fact. Uh, those who have uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas, uh, uh, such as uh, the high-grade tumors, they are generally treated with uh, chemotherapy. And over here, the difference is between whether the KI-67 is more than 55% or less than 55%. So those patients who have a KI-67 of 20 to 55%, they would be treated with a combination of timozolomide or capecitabine. But those who have uh, uh, KI67 or more than 55% generally, they will be treated with platinum based uh, chemotherapy. So, KI67 is very important, and uh, so that can help you decide what type of therapy you would like to give. Uh, the other drugs are sunitinib and nevrolimus, but sunitinib is only used for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors because that is how the data is. But nevrolimus is used for both pancreatic as well as non pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the Radiant 2 was a phase 3 study, although, the, although overall it was a negative study, it was for low and inter intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumors, mainly with consisting of patients with neuroendocrine uh, with carcinoid syndrome as well. And uh, they were low grade tumors and they were randomized to Everolimus plus Octutide versus Octutide alone. It was necessary to give Octutide with Everolimus in this particular study. And the primary endpoint was PFS. Although there was improvement in the PFS uh, from 11 months to 16.4 months, but uh, the p-value is 0.02, but it did not reach statistical significance. So uh, the, it was not really approved for carcinoid syndrome and patients with uh, mid-cut tumors. Uh, although the PFS for all subtypes was in favor of uh, using uh, uh, the Everolimus, but the, the regulatory approval was not received. Therefore, uh, the uh, Novartis people, they did another study called as the Radiant 4 study where it was not necessary to give LAR30. These patients could have progressed on LAR30 and it was placebo versus Everolimus. So just see the difference. Over there, LAR30 was given in both the arms. Over here, it is Everolimus versus placebo. So they were smart enough to design this study so that it com comes out as a positive study. And uh, it included lung as well as GI origin neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, over here, the PFS was now improved, 3.9 months versus 11 months, as a ratio improved and the statistical significance was achieved. So uh, overall, Everolimus was approved for neuroendocrine tumors of, um, of GI origin. Transarterial hepatic embolization and chemoembolization can be done uh, if, if liver dominant disease is there, but there's no randomized controlled trials in this regard. Survival benefit is, is 
is questionable, but partial responses are seen in about 50%. However, it can result into carcinoid crisis. If there is cell lysis, there is release of a lot of serotonin and hence patient can have carcinoid crisis. IV uh, octotide infusion has to be pre and post therapy in mid-gut carcinoid so that there is no carcinoid crisis. However, hepatic failure, one has to consider what is the normal volume of uh, normal liver which is there and to avoid any unseen mortality with embolization, bland embolization or chemoembolization. Other uh, methods of uh, liver directed therapies are radiofrequency ablation, laser induced uh, thermotherapy, cryotherapies. So generally, if there is limited disease and less than three centimeter lesions, such therapies can be helpful. Somatostatin analog targeted radiotherapy, and these are beta emitting somatostatin analog delivery, uh, delivering a lethal radiation dose. So we have the NETR-1 study, which uh, randomized uh, patients to octotide LAR uh, high dose. And these were patients who were progressing on octotide LAR therapy. So they were given randomized to higher dose of octotide LAR versus continuation of uh, octotide LAR plus four administrations of uh, lutathera, that is lutetium-based uh, somatostatin uh, therapy. And uh, it was an uh, international randomized controlled uh, trial. And as you can see that the progression free survival was in excess of uh, 28, 30 months as compared to around 11 months in the control arm. So overall survival was also improved. And as you can see in this forest plot that all subsets improved. So there was certain side effect, more or less whosoever has used it. We know that it is quite fairly well tolerated protocol. There was good amount of responses in the tune of around um, around 17% um, uh, good responses, objective responses uh, was almost to the tune of 58% or so. So you can see that overall response is around 58%. So they did include some pancreatic, some bronchial, some, although it was mainly mid-gut, as you can see that majority of patients were mid-gut and uh, 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 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but even hindgut were there. And the median progression free survival was in the tune of 28 months, although the four gut tumors were even 43 months progression free survival. And uh, the response was around 50, uh, 30 to 50-60%. And the duration of response was in excess of um, around um, 18 months or so. And median progression free survival almost reaching uh, 28, two and a half years. Uh, uh, so uh, these are the uh, various graphs for uh, JEPnet and with uh, lutetium-based therapies. And there are other uh, drugs which have been, people have tried to combine with bevacizumab, with PEG interferon alpha and all that stuff, but not really any major difference in, uh, in, uh, by these drugs. So not really approved. Um, so it is very important to understand uh, the tumor histology, the location, the positivity on the gallium 68 PET CT scan, the tumor burden, the status, presence and absence of uh, carcinoid heart disease, mesenteric fibrosis, and what the cost that the patient can bear. As far as uh, grade three JEPnets are concerned, as I said, that KI67 is a very important index, and we use that. So between 20 to 55 percent, uh, generally people will use timozolomide and capecitabine in combination called as the CAPTEM protocol. And above 55 percent, people will use mostly a platinum-based chemotherapy. And once these patients fail timozolomide, capecitabine, one can go into Paul Fox or Paul Ferry type of therapy. These tumors, we don't really know whether they respond to molecularly targeted therapies such as Avrolimus or sunitinib or PRRT. So generally, these are not routinely used. And as far as chemotherapy is concerned, for high grade, more than 55% tumors, the platinum etoposide combination is generally used, and the response rate sits around 30 to 40%. And uh, the median progression free survival is about six months, with a median overall survival of around 11 months. Uh, I think uh, I just uh, quickly touch upon what how how does a, um, a gastric uh, net is uh, is is approached. So you need to do the serum gastrin level. And if the serum gastrin levels are high, it is likely to be type one or type two. If the tumor is less than one centimeter, you can do endoscopic surveillance and resections. If it is more than one centimeter, you may do endoscopic resection if it is the infiltration is up to the submucosa, but if it is muscular propria, which is involved, then generally you will have to um, do a proper resection of the tumor. 
and uh, you have, you can use somatostatin analogs to control the symptoms and as I, as I said over here then it is uh, likely to be a local resection or entrectomy which can be done in atrophic gastritis you entrectomy is is one of the treatment options you can do an entrectomy local resection and use somatostatin analogs and do endoscopic surveillance in uh, type 3 where the gastrin levels are normal surgical resection always surgical resection and if very very advanced then systemic treatment is to be done and the guidelines for systemic treatment is the same you can start with uh, lar 30 and if the patient fails then prrt and things like that and uh, again the the principles of treatment are same for duodenal entities and mostly surgical resection has to be done if the tumor is very small you can do an endoscopic resection and uh, if the tumor is larger then a proper surgical resection has to be done even for uh, guidelines for intestinal entities again if uh, a complete resection can be done uh, it is it is good otherwise octotide lendrotide is to be given and uh, for grade 1 grade 2 tumors for grade 3 tumors you you can give either trimozolomide capecitabine as you see over here or cisplatin etoposide depending on their ki67 and once you once a patient fails octotide lar therapy then prrt can be given or you can add everolimus at that point in time and uh, you can give uh, sometimes interferon alpha which i have not really used sometimes local regional therapy such as chemoembolization these are all treatment options so there is no preference over one over the other but i think the idea is octotide lar and prrt and then perhaps anything else because these will be the most non toxic therapies coming to pancreatic uh, and net so there are separate studies that's the reason i'm i'm, I'm discussing this so uh, the Avrolimus study was uh, against best supportive care and it was a phase 3 radiant 3 trial and uh, this was uh, for well model uh, grade 1 and grade 2 tumors and you can see that the pfs improved from 4.6 months to 11 months very similar to the radiant 4 study and uh, the other study was the sunitinib study and as i said that the dose is 37.5 mg it is only for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors but sometimes people do extrapolate these results and use sunitinib for uh, even uh, enteric uh, neuroendocrine tumors the pfs was wa improved from 5.5 months to 11.4 months it was an NEGM publication uh, pazopinib has been used but it didn't really result into increased uh, survival so not really as a part of um, guidelines timozolomide uh, pancreatic entities uh, it can be used and uh, captam is a protocol and uh, we have used this with very good partial remission of around 70 percent and a pfs of around 18 months and it's generally very well tolerated these are the doses 750 milligram per meter square day 1 to day 14 and timozolomide from day 10 to day 14 uh, in the dose of 200 milligram per meter square Steptosulcin and 5-fluorouracil is uh, used in advanced entities and you can see that generally patients who have a KI67 of less than 15% are the ones who really benefit quite a lot. Otherwise, uh, perhaps uh, the CAPTEM protocol can be used. So um, the treatment algorithm is uh, for pancreatic entities is if it is advanced, uh, think of surgery, radiofrequency ablation. If the proliferation index is low, you can use SSAs and if there is progression PRRT, otherwise one can think of Everolimus sunitinib. So there's nothing to choose between these uh, agents, but generally speaking, PRRT will, will be preferred and because these uh, treatments have a lot of side effects. And if the KI67 is high, then perhaps cytotoxic therapy, either CAPTEM, and if it is very, very high, more than 55%, then platinum-based or platinum etoposide combination. So neuroendocrine tumor is an amal. That is the reason perhaps Dr. Dodal mentioned that, you know, it is difficult to manage because it's an amalgamation of a lot of different subtypes or types of diseases. And uh, generally, uh, you have to involve surgeons because surgery is the mainstay of the treatment. You have to involve an endocrinologist and sometimes cardiologist. You have to involve uh, nuclear medicine people because PRRT is involved. You have to in involve gastroenterologists because sometimes you have to do endoscopic ultrasound or a capsule endoscopy and see if endoscopic resections can be done in very early diseases. Of course, oncologists are there and pain palliative care specialists. Pathologist is a very important uh, member of uh, treating neuroendocrine tumors because uh, you need to know the correct diagnosis. The KI-67 and the grading of the tumor is very, very important. It cannot be diagnosed on an FNAC. You've got to have a biopsy. 
And uh, so multidisciplinary approach is very important in diagnosing, accurate diagnosing, staging of disease, evaluation on quality of life, and consensus uh, agreement on treatment plan with a surgeon, with a nuclear medicine uh, doctor, medical oncologist, and of course the patient. Thank you very much.